thinking of investing, working, or starting a business in the cannabis industry? We've got you covered right here on Plant Problems. Hosted by Tony Frischconnect, Plant Problems takes a different approach to cannabis than what you're seeing and hearing from the mainstream media. Come along with Tony and be in the know about how to invest, work, or start a cannabis business. Let's get the show started with your host, Tony Frischconnect. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Plant Problems. I'm your host, Tony Frisch Connect. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining me today. So what most of us hear in cannabis, at least one of the biggest topics is, of course, financing and banks, right? We hear this constantly. Uh, articles are always coming out. Oh, there's no banking for cannabis or how do we get funding? Everybody's self-funded, you know, and if you've got uh, if you've got money, you've got some deep pockets from who knows where people are coming up with it. So today I'm bringing on uh, a guest that, that has been in this industry for over 10 years now. So he knows the ins and outs of financing, and we're going to talk some banking stuff. So he created the Alternative Finance Network to serve marijuana and hemp business owners by providing one-stop shopping for all your loan needs. Whether it's financing real estate, equipment, working capital, or accounts receivable, he has a funding source who can fund a loan and get your best possible rate and terms for your needs. Please welcome back to the show, the Marijuana Money Man, Scott Jordan. Scott, thanks so much for being on. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Tony. Thank you so much. It was great seeing you, by the way, last week, or I guess it was two weeks ago at the NOCO Hempo. Hemp Expo. I mean, it felt like I got let out of jail or something. Not that I know what that is like, but I mean, <laughs> figuratively speaking, it was like, oh my God, three dimensional people that I can run into randomly that I know, like, and trust. Wow. It was yeah, great. It was awesome. I, I agree with you. You know, being back, that's pretty much the first event that I was at and I could see the, the energy in the air, even though we had our masks on, which is, you know, created some issues just by talking and every, we were out in public. So whatever we had to do to be there, I was fine with how, how did you feel about it? Oh, it was great. It was great seeing people. I thought it was a good show. Hats off to Morris and his team for pulling that off uh, so effectively. And, uh, it was great seeing people. It was great seeing you. Yeah, you as well, Scott. Well, for the listeners out there and, and people that are viewing on YouTube right now, uh, of course, please follow us on both. That'd be great. Uh, you know, we went to uh, the Hemp Expo, which started in northern Colorado and has moved down to Denver. And man, it seemed like there was three or four hundred booths there. I, I didn't count them all, but they had a they have a big area at the National St Western Stock Show in downtown Denver. And they've got uh, they had two different floors, a lower level and then they had the upper. Did you get a chance to get upstairs at all? I did. It was great. I mean, it was uh, it was really nice seeing some of the companies there. Definitely. Yeah, I met some pretty interesting folks, and and I and for those of you out there, I'm gonna bring. Uh, I'm gonna you're gonna hear in the next few episodes. You're gonna hear some of these people that I've been interviewing and, and talking to there that got some amazing stuff. So let's get back into the financing and banking. All right, one of the let's biggest talk things. Money, baby. Yeah, money. exactly, exactly. One of the biggest things that people have been talking about, especially in in the industry for it seems like a couple of years now, is the Safe Banking app. You know, if you're not familiar with it out there, this is, they're trying to get some legislation in place that allows them to, uh, to, to do banking, basically. I mean, when, when it comes down to it, right? I mean, Scott, there's, there's details in this, but it gets some, allows banks that are in hemp and cannabis to do banking. So, you know, what can you tell us about the Safe Banking Act that, you know, maybe people, people aren't aware of out there right now. So I think um, that it's going to be uh, potentially passed with a bunch of watered down provisions like Congress always does. Yeah. And uh, I'm glad 
what's happened is it has a chance these days because Mike Crapo, who used to be head of the Senate Banking Committee, staunch anti-marijuana uh, with the election changeover here, is no longer in charge of that. So I'm hoping the vestiges of what he has left behind are not going to continue and that uh, it will be passed. What will happen is it will allow more banks to get into the business of banking cannabis people. And it will also allow the banks to not have the draconian sword over their head if they violate uh, the rules that they would be personally prosecuted. So uh, I think it'll open things up uh, more uh, for lending, although I think uh, what I hear from people is they think the day that the Safe Banking Act passes, all of a sudden banks are going to be opening up and lending. Yeah, That's not really the case because the banks are only going to lend to the best of the best of the customers. And most of the people that need a loan are not going to qualify for it. Um, who will benefit is the larger MSOs, the larger companies that are established for three, four, five years. They will um, now have more choices of bank financing. But as a precursor to that, and one of the things that my company has done, the Alternative Finance Network, is we have a number of banks now that are lending quietly. They're not waving the flag. They're not um, standing up and saying, hey, come on in. We got a loan application for you because they know, number one, they'll be overwhelmed. And yeah. Two, eight out of 10 people don't qualify. So the banks come to us as a way to clean and screen um, viable applicants to give them exactly what they want, teed up in the order they want, and uh, knowing what their criteria is, it makes it very easy for them to then uh, go through and approve, you know, 10, 12, 15 deals a week. Without that, they would drown in a bunch of looky loos that are not going to qualify. And so we've been very fortunate in that being in the marketplace since 2009, I know a fair amount of people, and uh, many of them have decided to cross over the green line, as I say. Uh, after the election and many more uh, January 21st, you know, when things settled down in Washington and, uh, you know, Biden was able to enter the office and, uh, and you know, take, take things over here. Uh, it's a very exciting time because rates have come down from the low double digits for the best of the best, you know, 12, 13 percent. We now have... Uh, Real estate loans at five and a half to six. I, I think have. too, Scott. Let, let, so let me let's talk about that for a second. Sure. You know, for for a world we live in with financing, and most people are familiar with, uh, you know, the re refinancing that's been happening over the last twelve months. Massive refinance. People hear this 13 percent, and they're like, "Oh my god, how is that?" Scott, tell me how bad it really was. 10 years ago. <laughs> okay. So when I first started, I did my first marijuana loan in 2009. The rate was <laughs> 40% over eight months daily payments, which turns out to be an annualized rate of about 120% when you look at it and you look at the payback. It was just crazy. So imagine borrowing $100,000, repaying $140,000 back daily payments over uh, an eight month period of time. It was just Insane. very, very high. That, that, and I want, I want people to really grasp that because, you know, again, we live in this world where we're talking two and 3% to finance, refinance your home. <laughs> and he's talking about paying pretty much you're paying double. So if you want a hundred grand, you're paying a hundred grand, you know? And so, yeah. So, that is mind blowing. And I know we paid growing up through the industry, we paid some massive 20, 30% interest rates. So if you guys find a deal out there and you're hemming and hawn about nine and 10%, you got to look at the reality of the situation. It used to be 10 times worse. Uh, and, and Scott's seen the whole gamut, I'm sure. Right, Scott? Oh yeah. And have the scars to prove it as well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, 
what were what would you say are some of the best findings financing deals out there for the average cannabis business right now? Um, we've got real estate now at in the uh, mid fives to mid six percent on a long term basis uh, from a life insurance company and a bank. That's um, really good. Twenty year amortization, ten year fixed. It's a great great loan, uh, particularly if you're coming off eleven and twelve percent interest. I was on a call just before this one with a guy that manages a very large, two large funds. He has many household names in it. He couldn't believe that the rates have dropped that low that quickly. And I said, yeah, I mean, the banks are now out, out there competing. And from the banker's point of view, which very few people will tell you about, but I'm going to let your listeners in on kind of the secret. Here, here's what they're thinking. What they're thinking, the aggressive ones are thinking, I can get 100 to 150 basis point premium for a warehouse that's a cannabis tenant as opposed to a warehouse that is uh, a non-cannabis tenant. I'm going to go ahead and take that premium to enhance my, uh, my profitability. And that's one of the reasons why they're doing it. The second is, is they, they feel certain that the Safe Banking Act will pass in some form or another. So they want to kind of beat the crowd to the gate there and they want to also pick off some of the best customers because now is the time if you're a marijuana business owner to go ahead and get yourself aligned with a bank that will be lending to you that understands your situation and that you'll have a relationship with and that's what we do is we facilitate those relationships where you ride in on my coattails you draft on my um you know on my being a uh ahead of you in the crowd and you get to the front of the line or you get told, look, you're not ready. You know, you got to have uh, certain things in order to be ready for a bank. And many people that I see that haven't been through the audit process or uh, having their financials in order don't qualify for. It. And so that's um, a good, that's a solid point. I mean, for 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 the listeners out there this is something that you know when you did get a bank account like we were one of the fortunate few in the beginning when when we found our bank and and if anybody hasn't listened to scott before he he was very very early in my uh, my beginning episodes i think you were in the first 10 i believe scott and he actually worked with a bank was one of the very first banks in colorado uh, to provide bank accounts, and they also um, the uh, the president and uh, owner of the of the bank also uh, created a ton of regulation around uh, banking for cannabis specifically. Right? Yeah, Sunny was a pioneer. God bless her soul. Um, and uh, as I tell people, she is the Jackie Robinson Rosa Parks combination for banking in the cannabis industry, she took a huge chance, huge. She could have gone to jail for her lifetime and her kid's lifetime and her grandkid's lifetime five times over had sessions or Trump w woke up one day and decided mm, we're eliminating to, this industry. Yeah. To make an example and of her. I mean, she would have had no backup. She would have had no defense. Um, on that because she was technically money laundering. And even though she was following the regulators and um, she's a brilliant woman and a great strategist, um, the regulations were not the law. And so, um, you know, had things not worked out, um, she could have been in jail. And that's a risk. Even, e even myself that is on the bleeding edge of things a lot of times, I wouldn't take that risk, especially, you know, at the stage of life that uh, we are both are in here where, you know, we want to enjoy life a little bit because um, we've worked hard our whole life. So mm -hmm. I really, um, the whole industry owes a debt of gratitude uh, towards her because had she not started down the path, she wrote the book, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't have the amount of lending choices that we currently have today. Yeah. It, uh, you know, we just, you, we were, I think we were a product of timing in order to get banking, but you know, for, for those that are not in Colorado, um, how would you suggest they go about, uh, finding financing or do you do out of state too? I'm sorry. I didn't even ask that. 
Yeah, we're in all 50 states. And okay. of course, it's legal. We can help. Um, and uh, we know the bankers that are banking in each particular state. So if someone is unbanked currently uh, and doesn't know where to go, be happy to help them. Um, but is there availability? Is there space? Because, I mean... The last last I looked for banking, and this has been a while ago, a few years, but um, people have waiting lists. Are there availabilities to hop on some of these uh, local chartered banks? You know, the best banks, the one with the lowest rates, are the ones that you're probably going to have to wait for. Okay. Um, but banking has opened up tremendously, and you know, a couple of years in this business is like, uh, you know, dog years. I yep. mean, uh, it's a completely different landscape. Uh, uh, before November, you know, before November this year, the choices that I now have the life insurance company, the, uh, hedge fund, the, uh, bank, I've got a bank that is lending, um, you know, uh, in the mid fives for the right type of deals. And that's fantastic. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's great. And I would, I would have killed for that right now. If you'd have told me that I would, I would have killed people for that. It, it, it's, it's unbelievable. I, I, you're, you've got, I've got goosebumps from that because I'm like, Oh my God, if I had had that opportunity, I would have just taken that. All my business partners would have too. We were like, wow, we can, finance real estate because you know for for those of you who haven't caught uh some of some past episodes there were times where we were dealing with landlord issues and oh my gosh they put you over a barrel if you didn't have to if you didn't have to negotiate renegotiate your lease every year year and a half because for some reason the city needed some from sign off from the landlord you were just you just bent over and said, oh, I guess I got to take it. It was bad. Oh, yeah. I mean, pe people don't realize the risk that all of you, because you were in early days, I think, with Lacantes, right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, the early days were so difficult because you, you didn't have the money to buy the building. There was no hard money or very few hard money lenders out there to even buy the building. If you didn't have cash to buy your warehouse, you were putting in millions of dollars to upgrade the lights and everything else to grow, not knowing if the landlord was going to have a change of heart or, you know, I've heard stories, you know, landlord died, kids took over, they were anti-marijuana, locked the doors, and you were done. I mean, you were D-O-N-E done. Yeah. And you invested millions and millions of dollars and... Nobody was giving you any love back then. I mean, everybody thought you were just making money hand over fist, which is not the case. You know, yeah. Uh, no, any, anybody that's all. trying, that's working in it or just started, it gets it. They understand that. <laughs> they go, oh my well, God. File I your first tax return <laughs> yes. and you see what your, uh, see what your accountant says about this little thing called 280E. And then tell me how much you net after that. And, 280, you know. man. That's another one. And, and I, I talk about that in several episodes. So let's get back then. So in your opinion, since people can get banking now, because I, I know it's possible and I've seen it happening and it's you said it's opened up quite a bit more. Banks are more comfortable. Uh, I'm sure they're following the book that Sunday wrote. Um, you know, in your opinion, what is what does the Safe Banking Act really bring to the industry? It's going to bring some safety to the midsize and larger banks. It's going to open up, I think, uh, hopefully merchant services as well as lending uh, from the same institution that you're depositing into. I think those will be really the major things that um, customers will see. There'll be a lot of things behind the scenes that will make it uh, hopefully easier. Uh, but my prediction is, is that's really not going to probably happen until the latter half of the year. And then it'll be watered down like everything else that yeah. you know, Congress does. You know, somebody will have a special interest. They'll want to put that in. Um, but really, I mean, today you can get banking in any state of the, of the union for more than one bank. Um, and it really is not as big a deal as it was back in 09. You know, when we got started back in the day, Mm -hmm. There were no banks that were legally doing it until Sunday came along. Uh, well, you had one bank uh, that was doing it uh, back then. Uh, but other than that, and they were very quiet about it, and you had to be out on the Western Slope in order to uh, you know, get a real bank account. Yeah. 
I, I, those days of, you know, if you got a bank account, you didn't tell, I mean, even your closest friends, you wouldn't tell the name of that bank. <laughs> because uh, oh, you didn't day. want to get shut down you're like oh we finally got somebody that'll take our money and you know for those of you out there that are like well i want the absolute best rates i i get it however having banking period is worth paying for at least for now and you're probably not going to be looking at i mean safe banking act gets passed um we're going to see a quick shift there, like, like Scott's saying, and, and that is going to open up banks all over the place. And soon enough, you, you know, I'm not going to say your Wells Fargo and stuff are going to jump right on it, but eventually they will. Cause they'll see the, nobody's getting in trouble and everybody's following the rules. Agreed. It's pretty awesome. So anyway, we're going to see a reduction. Do you think it's going to go lower than that in, in uh, interest rates? Um, probably. I mean, um, I think this is kind of the first foray into the market. As I mentioned, you know, fr from the bank point of view, they feel like they're getting a hundred to 150 point um, basis premium. So they're, they, they love it as long yeah. as the risk is not there. They are all in favor of it. And uh, I think uh, as we see what the default rates is, so what people don't understand, especially uh, people that are borrowing money on the cannabis side, is the biggest expense you have, you don't know what it's going to be. It's the default rate. When I first was starting to uh, get into um, uh, uh, procuring loans, we had to stick a number in there. We didn't know whether that number was going to be 2% or 20%. Okay. So when you're looking at that, you have to realize that some, not everyone's going to pay their bills. And when you get stuck in an early default, it really eats up a lot of profit and a lot of margin. And so as a result, you've got to overestimate for that. And you've got to have, you know, seven to eight, nine points built in above what you're borrowing at. And because previous to me starting to offer your, um, revolving lines of credit for banks, credit unions, and hard money lenders, there was no one that was doing what we call a rediscount line. A rediscount line is where we go ahead, someone goes ahead and lends to someone to relend out. And so okay. right now, you know, five and a half, six percent is possible to get. So you can relend out at nine, ten. And especially if you're a bank or a credit union and have the deposits you're going to be pretty safe because a, it's very difficult to change bank accounts if you have one mm -hmm. and B, if you default, they will have a provision in the loan documents setting off the payment and taking that payment right out of your account to make sure that they're a hundred percent in compliance. And then the third thing is, is because the industry is so small and the banking industry has only got a handful of players in each state, you don't want to be on that bad boy list. Uh, and not be able to get another bank account because you defaulted on the previous one. So, yeah, I, I think you're a, an absolute moron if you were to, even if defaulted and then you, and you lost, lost to lose your bank account would be just moronic. Right. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. You know, the, everybody that's been in cannabis for quite some time has, has some changes and, you know, you, you, you started out with dy dynamic funding, correct? Correct. Yeah. And so as we evolve and we shift, we're going into new areas, starting new companies. So how was that for you to make that shift? Was it pretty easy or have, have you had a lot of, what kind of challenges have you had? So uh, my career in cannabis started with uh, dynamic funding, dynamic funding, uh, because we started doing so much business and they had two other businesses created a separate company called uh, Dynamic Alternative Finance. Okay. And I, uh, I was with them for five years. Uh, the company got sold. Um, I took a job with another company in California that promised a lot and delivered uh, very little of what they promised. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to uh, go out on my own and create my own company because I've got the contacts, I've got the network, I've got the, um, the ability to do this let me go ahead and uh, 
see what I can do on my own. And I started uh, the Alternative Finance Network with the idea of bringing to cannabis business owners the best possible rate and terms for their situation with a multitude of lenders. And so it was difficult getting started at first, um, but because I had the reputation and because as uh, people say, you know, you're an OG's OG in the industry you know, <laughs> yeah. because I'm old and I'm also, uh, you know, an old gangster in the industry. Yeah. I was able to, um, you know, get some business developed. And now recently with rates lowering, uh, I now have a very exciting product for the multi-state operators that are looking for revolving lines of credit. We'll be announcing a deal here shortly with a, uh, a multi-state operator where we're doing a revolving line of credit in the uh, mid single digits, which is unheard of. Wow. Uh, it really helps their business out quite a bit. Absolutely. It up a couple of weak spots that they have in terms of, um, of not quite having all of the cash um, that would be needed to run, you know, a more efficient business. They'll be able to make up. Well, when you don't have terms on anything and everybody's cash COD is, it's great when you're small, you're like, cool, I'm making this happen. But when you go from, you know, a thousand or $10,000 up to hundreds of thousands, it's like how, you, you know, you're cash poor real quick. Oh yeah. And the industry is changing in that regards, by mm -hmm. the way. Uh, I didn't used to see any accounts receivable on people's balance sheets back in the day. And as of the last one, one to two years, I would say it's much more common. And, um, you know, many companies are having to offer terms to be competitive. Uh, but I think that's a really great thing. And then I, I'm a big believer of owning your real estate. Why not have your customers pay off your mortgage? If you can get a mortgage long-term at a low rate. And so I think you'll see a lot of changes in, um, in the world uh, of cannabis, because when you can get a mortgage at five, five and a half percent, why would you go ahead and do a sale lease back to IIPR or any of the other guys at 12 plus 3% escalators every single year? Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make sense. Why not have your customers build your balance sheet for you by paying down the existing mortgage that you have? I mean, that's the beauty of how so many people have gotten wealthy or at least comfortable by having someone else pay off their mortgage. Of course, of course. You know, I, I'm glad you brought that up and you even brought up IPR. You know, that's uh, been a booming stock for the last couple of years. Um, yeah. You know, they've been, they've been flying high for a while. You know, what do you think the Safe Banking Act is? How is that going to affect their business? I think that um, they'll see a decrease in business. Um, I think that um, the days of getting you know, 12% plus escalators are uh, going to come to an end. I think uh, that they will, what I'm hearing and where we're focusing our efforts on is lending to the lenders who say, hey, you know, I want to come down to nine. I want to come down to nine or 10. I think also as more banks get into it, there'll be other sources of capital for people wanting to own real estate. I think everybody wants to own their own real estate whenever they can. It only makes sense to be able to control your own destiny, build an asset, and be able to have that there for um, utilizing on your own balance sheet or you know, to create uh, legacy wealth for you and your family. So I agree uh, it'll that be interesting to see what happens. <laughs> the prices on real estate, uh, I haven't checked any warehouse, warehouse real estate, but, but you know, into 2021 have been crazy so i i it'll be interesting to see what those prices actually happen square footage because in denver alone i mean the real estate um you know for warehouse is, is pretty much non-existent and if it is it's super expensive i mean some of these newer states are starting to probably realize this uh, well i know they are the newer markets uh, there are these landlords that have been sitting in these dead properties for decades are now capitalizing on this. And, you know, what would you get, what kind of advice would you give for landlords out there that are, that are lending in newer markets? Be prepared for cap rate compression and, uh, be prepared to, um, have better equipped, uh, and more financially sound, 
uh, borrow or, or tenants in your, in your business. And then watch out for what's happening in the greenhouse space. Because, uh, you know, as you know, greenhouse technology has improved quite a bit. Lighting has gotten a lot better. Mm-hmm. We've got a tremendous offer for people that need to put up a cultivation, uh, particularly in a rural area where we can do 100% financing on the land and the uh, structure, and then 90% on the interior uh, build out and fit out of the equipment. So someone can come in with 10% down on the equipment and stand up a cultivation. That's and they can buy land really, really cheaply. That's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. It, it re- I mean, t- tell them back in the day. That, 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 that is... <laughs> God dang it. That's insane. It is. You know, I, we would have given our left arm for a deal like that. I mean, 10%. Sure. We can come up with, you know, what's a million bucks out there. We can come up with a hundred grand. No problem. Absolutely. Um, And 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 we're aiming this at the social equity applicants. One of the things that we think is going on is that it's great to get a license but getting a license without the money to do it and to t- take and build it out is like getting a Ferrari with no gas. Or no engine, have right? The gas. <laughs> you gotta have the gas to be able to get to the next spot. And if you don't, the license um, is valueless. So what we're doing right now is is we're we're putting together um, a couple of things to help the social equity applicants. Number one, I am uh, going to stand up a site here called uh, Cannabis Capital Institute, where I'm going to make my presentations available that I've given over the years at these expensive conferences on what do you do? How do you get the money? What should the money cost? Mm -hmm. What do you have to do to prepare? How do you present effectively? What are the questions you need to ask? What are the questions you need to not ask? What are the things that you want to highlight? All of those things. There is no education that I've seen out there for cannabis business owners looking for money for their business. I want to fill that void. And then secondarily, for the social um, equity applicants, they need to know, A, how to raise the money, and B, if there's a partner that can make it easy for them to get into business, better to own you know, 51% of something that has the money to be able to succeed than a hundred percent of a license where you can't possibly be successful because the days of like back in the day of 2009, one of the uh, more famous companies that has uh, built stores and then sold off to a large public company, they started with uh, $150,000 and five pounds of weed they'd grown in their basement. Yeah. And that was how they started. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. That's how a lot of us here. started hear how Lucantes got started and what you guys did, but I mean, it was total hand to mouth grassroots, you know, sinking everything in and, oh, yeah. uh, you know, making it happen. Yeah, it was, it was, it was do or die. I mean, you, you really didn't give yourself the opportunity. I mean, myself personally, I started with 30,000 bucks and some 30,000 bucks, wow. 30,000 bucks. And then what did you end up selling out for? I'm curious. <laughs> Can you tell the viewers? <laughs> Well, I, I'm still under a contract now. I, I, I can't uh, really divulge the exact amount, but it's in the millions. Um, you know, it's wow. multi millions. That, that is huge. And that and huge. yeah, no, it's it's insane. And and the reality is is uh, you know, timing was a, a lot on our side and and the ability to, you know, well, we were just stubborn and our persistence was, you know, finally took over. But, you know, when it comes down to it, like you were talked about the social equity, I talked to people and uh, I've talked to some people on the East coast and they said the majority of those social equity people, they got the license and they have no, they don't know how to build a business to find the money to bring people in. They don't know. They don't have any channels. They don't have any contacts. And so a lot of them are, they have to partner up or they have to give away a lot of their ownership. Like you said, I mean, it's swapping that dollars for that, you know, swapping dollars for, for shares or, or actual percentage in the company. And that's, 
really what you have to negotiate when you're you're in that position. So it's amazing that you actually have some options for people out there. The one thing is, you know, giving away ownership isn't always a negative thing if they're bringing something to the table besides just the money. If there's some opportunity there for, for those out there who are like, well, I don't want to give away any ownership. Well, there's a lot of things that you don't know how to do. Um, and if you're able to find that partner, I mean, in your opinion, Scott, how, how many people uh, are doing this completely on their own? Very few. I mean, unless you're rich. I mean, nowadays, I wouldn't even consider getting into the space unless I had minimum, minimum of $10 million. Wow. And I could afford to lose it. Because when yeah. you look at the licensing, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can afford you to lose on it. a million, let alone 10 million. I mean, that's the, that's the deal. I mean, you know, if you, if you don't have it or access to it, you're going to be like going over the Golden Gate Bridge with a thimble full of gas and not knowing if you're going to make it over to the other side. And if you don't make it over to the other side, what are you going to do? How are you going to get you know, to the other side? It's a very expensive business to operate. And despite what I see as being um, the popular myth here, people are not making oodles and oodles of money, especially owning a retail space, especially now when you're fighting 280E and the draconian tax burden that you face. You know, the worst that I see is people that are losing money and when they lose money, they're now having to come up with the taxes owed because oh, yeah. they're getting taxed on the gross revenue when it's retail and they don't realize that. And, you know, when you form an LLC rather than a C Corp, that travels with you. you you're never getting out of that debt. Never, I mean, what, what you owe the IRS and, you know, it's just, it's very difficult. It's brutal. I mean, I think that, when I bring that up to, um, you know, potential people that are looking to get in the industry, they don't understand that as of now with it not being uh, federally uh, legal, uh, nationally legal, right, that they are subject, they're, they're, they don't have the backing of, of bankruptcy court. So they can't go in and uh, file bankruptcy. So well, what does that mean? right? <laughs> what does that mean to the owner? Well, that, that, what that means is you owe it. It's just going to sit all over your head and they're, they're not going to, they won't get rid of the debt because right. you're, they don't recognize you. And it's, we're back to the whole uh, taxation without representation. And, and it's, it's unfortunate because I can't imagine once you're in that state of mind, dealing with the stress of losing everything, not just, you know, the financial aspect, but your family, your friends, everything is just going by the wayside to be able to have the strength and, uh, you know, willingness to fight forward, to actually compete against something uh, of, of your creditors like that. I, I don't even know you, how you'd have the stamina to do it. You would just fold. I mean, and that's when, unfortunately, you know, uh, I, I think people would turn to uh, having mental issues, probably suicide, stuff like that. I mean, I, I can't imagine the the amount of, of pressure on your life that would add. Sure, sure. So let's turn this back to positive. Yeah, here. yeah let's turn All it back right? to a positive. But anyway, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, I was just feeling for those folks out there that I know there's some of them, but you know the the opportunities are still massive. Um, I think if you are well positioned and you find somebody like Scott that has a financing avenue, I would jump on something like that hands down right now. Uh, of course, you know, always look at your details. I'm not telling you just because I know Scott, uh, you know, everything's closed up and right. So when you are looking at that, please make sure you understand what you're signing. That's always a first, uh, especially social equity. If this is your first business you're doing, you want to make sure you have somebody by your side. So I'd like to suggest that. I know there's uh, there's different gentlemen out there that, that, that provide services. And, you know, when you've got 
attorneys around you and stuff like that, hire somebody to help you. I, I can't stress that more. Uh, you know, hiring somebody and finding somebody you trust to represent some of your interests is you want something at the end of the day. And if you don't, if you're not paying attention to your financing and what you're signing, a lot of times, you know, I can't say that this is in Scott's realm, but in any financing realm, people can, uh, I mean, I'm sure you've heard some stories where people get duped, right, Scott? I have. And uh, I'll give you one tip here for your viewers. Uh, last night, I, uh, I took a look at a term sheet uh, from a uh, large equipment uh, vendor. Uh, it was an $8 million ask. Um, and the rate was going to be at uh, 15% and two points, but they wanted a $75,000 upfront fee. Oh, wow. And as I wrote him back and I said, the rate is reasonable considering your situation. The 2% cost is reasonable considering that. I said, but I have never seen in all of the 11 years I've been in the financing industry, when someone charges that larger fee, I've never seen a happy ending for the borrower, mm -hmm. ever. And I said, if there is one, great. Let me know. But I've never seen one because usually it's, they're going to take the fee and then there's going to be some excuse on why they can't do this or they're going to find something wrong with that or whatever. An upfront fee should pay for costs, you know, maybe ten to $20,000, depending on um, the uh, need for an appraisal. They will need an appraisal, you know, on some of the properties. But I said, I don't see this coming out as a happy ending. So, um that's, super That's just scary. one, one, you know, one tip. There are guys that run around, you know, they'll take, uh, there was a guy, uh, four years ago running around. Oh, I'll give you three, seven, five, no personal guarantee, 20 year am like a fantasy type of a loan. And, uh, <laughs> just give me 400,000 up front and no, don't worry about it. We'll, we're going to come through. I've never seen one of those deals materialize, not one. So, so yeah, so saying in that in in so many words, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is, right? You got it, you got it, and minimize your upfront expenses um, in terms of getting to a term sheet and getting to funding. Um, no one needs that kind of money unless there's going to be a, an eminent ripoff. And also, the other thing is, if someone continues to come back to you after they've given you a term sheet with uh, modifications. And they tell you they're the lender. They're probably not telling you the truth because they shouldn't have to continue to change terms. If they're actually writing the check, what's happening is, is they're going back to the real lender and the real lenders come in and saying, here's what the real terms are going to be. No selling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Once it gets the, the underwriting and those guys ask a lot of questions, if, if, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's an excellent point. So start being leery is what you're saying when you get to that point. Well, be, be cautious and then go with someone with experience. I mean, this is an important thing to do. I mean, the financing is one of the most important aspects of the whole business. If you don't get that right, the rest of it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how good a grower you are, how efficient you are at running businesses. If you don't get the financing right, the rest is meaningless. So I say with that important a decision, go with someone that's been there, done that, and has the scars to show for it. Well, Scott, I, I really appreciate you being on. I, I, I learned a lot today, and um, I, I'm, you know, I'm excited for – uh, some of the stuff you're offering, you know, I, I, I'd be talking to you tomorrow or after this call, if I had some, if I was going to start a grow, because, uh, some of what you're saying is just never been available. Uh, when exactly. I say never, I mean, never, ever, ever exactly. <laughs> in the, the last 11 years money. has not been possible. Yep. Well, it's the greenhouse financing. I mean, has not been possible at that high a leverage. Yeah. I mean, come in with 10% down, you know, on a $3 million grow, come in with $300,000 and be able to build out probably 40, 50,000 square feet in a little town, you know, wherever it doesn't really matter as long as you can get power and, and water and utilities there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's unbelievable it is, that, it uh, is. that people will do that. So take advantage of it. Well, Scott, 
Thank you so much for being on. If people want to reach out to you, what's the best way? Go to my website. My website is really easy. It's alternativefinancenetwork.com. Great. Alternativefinancenetwork.com. If you want to see the bank rate program, it's forward slash bank rates. So alternativefinancenetwork.com forward slash bank rates. Uh, send me a line. Be happy to uh, see what I could do to help you grow your business. And uh, I wish all of you, you know, the best of luck in doing that and have a safe and wonderful 420. 11 more days. 420 <laughs> coming up here. I know. I know this is going to be playing in the, in it, here in a couple months. So unfortunately they're not going to catch oh, that, but okay. <laughs> that's okay. No, that's okay. I appreciate that. We've got um, guys also at plantproblem.com. All of Scott's information is going to be in there. You can click on it, find him there. It's real simple. So if you don't remember his his website, it's really easy to go into the blog page there at plantproblem.com and click on there. And I also want to thank you guys again for tuning in. I know this has been a bit of a longer episode, but some of the information he shared on here was truly valuable. So hopefully you were able to catch that. And I'm sure we will have Scott back again in the future. Probably after the Safe Banking Act, I would say it would probably be a good time, don't you think, Scott? Happy to do that. Uh, but you, you know, if it doesn't pass this year or next year, I'd certainly like to update your folks. Uh, you know, usually stuff happens in the fall after people get back from summer vacation. I find there's a lot of movement, so I'd love to, uh, you know, be back in October, November uh, okay. if the Safe Banking Act doesn't pass, and just that update things because there's so much changes in the in the industry. And if you don't know, it's an expensive lesson to learn mm -hmm. what's out there and what's available. So, absolutely, uh, you know, have them reach out to you or, uh, you know, whatever. But I really appreciate being on the show and I wish everybody a lot of luck. And maybe this will be out before 710 so that uh, they can celebrate Oil Day. Oil Day. That's right. 710. <laughs> <laughs> If you guys don't know what that is, Google it up and you'll see where you'll see where if 710 is Googled or uh, oil day, you'll check oil it out. Day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks right. for the tip, Scott. Very informative. Thank and thank you guys so much for listening. And I will see you guys next week. Have a great day. You've just listened to another insightful episode of Plant Problems. If you like what you heard so far, don't forget to tell your friends and colleagues. For additional resources or to leave a review, head over to plantproblem.com. Join us again next week on Plant Problems with Tony Frischconnect. We look forward to having conversations with you as we go along this journey.